So, Dave, how did the turnover to the Turner era and Jim Hurd affect, affect Ric Flair's stature and his pull in the organization and, and his say-so? Well, you know, he, you know, you know, George Scott made Ric Flair. You know, George Scott was the, you know, Ric Flair was a preliminary guy in the AWA who was recommended by Wahoo McDaniel. And he can't, you know, with, with you know, short, you know, kind of pudgy guy with dark hair and um, Wahoo brings him in and George Scott tells him to bleach his hair and I want you to be Buddy Rogers. You know, he ends up, want, he wants to be Ray Stevens, but they told him to watch tapes of Buddy Rogers. So he came in and he wants to be Ray Stevens, but, but, you know, and he, and he wasn't necessarily a good promo, but at the time Rick wasn't a good promo, believe it or not. But he, you know, he was a rising star and, and George Scott believed in him and moved him up the card for about a year and then programmed him with Wahoo and him and Wahoo had a tremendous view to drew very well. And when it was over, I mean, Rick was the king. Mm -hmm. So, so Rick, you know, I mean, for, for, so Rick had the booker who, who believed in him, um, which, which, you know, with Dusty, I mean, Dusty, you know, certainly respected Rick Flair, but he was sick of him. Um, so, so that period, you know, Rick was, Rick was going to be fine. And of course the guy who, you know, George Scott was also the booker who made Ricky Steamboat, who was, who was nobody in the business. Ricky, you know, was a good looking kid that Ole didn't think was a star. And I think he was in Florida and didn't do much of anything. And, you know, Vern trained him and Vern never, you know, Vern never did anything with him. And he comes to the Carolinas. He was supposed to go, I think, as I remember, he was leaving Georgia because Ole had nothing to do with him, didn't see nothing in him. And he was a, and Vern was, was booking him because the deal with Vern was you would give Vern um, for a, a certain, like for a certain number of years, um, I don't know, it was 10 years, it was a long time, but Vern was, was supposed to get, I think it was 10% of your money and in exchange he was your booker, maybe it was, maybe it was more than 10%, mm -hmm. I think it was 10%. And he would be your booker. So what would happen is, is he, he would, with his connections, he would get you into a territory. So you, you were, you know, you were guaranteed, like if you were in place for six months and your time was up as a prelim guy, you know, your, your career wouldn't end. Vern would look out for you because he was going to make money off of you. But Vern never brought him into the AWA after his, you know, he first started out. So he was done in Georgia and Vern booked him to Stampede Wrestling. So he was about to go up there. And somebody or other told him, hey, just come to, you know, he's in, he's, he's, he's living in Atlanta. Come into uh, Raleigh and just come in and do some TV. You know, so he comes in and Ric Flair and George Scott love the guy. You know, George Scott just sees, you know, this young, good looking bodybuilder and then just goes with him. And, and that was the end of, you know, so he went to the, the Carolinas and he became a big star. So George Scott was the first booker to, to do Steamboat. So mm. at this point, I, I believe Steamboat had quit WWF. Yeah. Uh, or been, you know, he'd quit WWF a couple years ago. So he's essentially out of the business. And so George Scott brings in Steamboat, and then that's the, the year of the Flair Steamboat. And That's 89. Yeah, that's the highlight matches, the, the Russell yeah. War, Nashville, those fantastic matches. Yeah. By the time they get to Starcade, you know, we've had the great Ric Flair feud with, with Terry Funk. That's run its course. So we go in with this Iron Man idea, which I just thought was just just terrible. Yeah. Well, I mean, we, it was like Starcade was Starcade was always um, you know, the culmination of the grudge matches, it was WrestleMania. And then they just did this tag team tournament and a singles tournament. And I mean it was a good card. I mean the matches were good and you got the Steiners beating the Road Warriors, which was a big huge thing at the time and that was a tough one too yep. um to get because the road wars didn't want to lose mm -hmm. but, but um you know with the steiners it was almost like if we put them in with the steiners and we tell the steiners they're going to win and the road warriors say no then the steiners are going to get mad at them so the road warriors don't want that so the road warriors did that loss but it was a cheap ass loss that nobody really looked good in but but it was it was news you know the road warriors and they, the road warriors got to win the tournament anyway and then the other tournament was um what Sting Flair puts over Sting, right? Came to down set. to Sting over Flair. That's right. Right. So, so they're both baby faces, and it's to set up, um, you know, the Flair Sting promo where the title is going to change hands a couple months later. The next year, ninety, yeah. So yeah. there's, 
so maybe well, maybe just through George Scott, but there seems to be at least initially in the Jim Hurd era some harmony between Ric Flair and Jim Hurd. It seems like Jim Hurd is agreeing uh, that Ric Flair is the guy. Turner says so. George Scott says so. But pretty quickly, uh, suddenly, Jim Hurd suggesting that uh, Ric Flair put an earring in and rename himself Spartacus. How does that happen? Because they they didn't have a great year at the box office and they were looking for answers and mm. the decision. The feeling was, at this point, that um, you know Rick's having these great matches. The mentality is is that in the company there were a bunch of guys in the company who knew nothing about wrestling, and and Jim may have been one of them. I mean, he was one of them, and he wasn't the only one. I remember talking to people who you know they hired some people who thought they knew wrestling who didn't know wrestling, and I remember, you know, it's not it's not um, the Turner people. It, this was. You know, just different people who I just remember at the end, of, you know, like during the the Flair Steamboat, everyone's kind of like raving about it, but it's not doing good business. Mm. And the Flair Funk thing, which actually does do pretty good business, but then it's you know it it ran it it, it kind of ran its course. And and with the Flair Funk thing, you start getting the oh we've got these two old guys there and we're getting beat by Vince and two old guys and two old guys and and Sting and Luger are the upcoming guys and they're the ones who are you know. We got to get them on top, and it, then it just built and built. The, the more they didn't draw, um, the more it was on Rick because Rick was the world champion. It was on Terry because Terry's an old man and he's on top. You know, not realizing that you know Rick Flair and Terry, in hindsight, was the best drawing feud they had until you know the NWO came in years later. But they, you know, they were, you know, they. Whatever it was, they they didn't draw in Chicago, but that's because they killed Chicago with the Road Warriors. Yep. Um, they didn't draw that well in the Carolinas in some places because you know Greensboro fans never forgave them for mm-hmm. Star Arcade. Um, they drew, they were drawing great in Atlanta, you know, so that was nice, but they weren't selling out. So you know, I mean, ten thousand people, they, you know, they were oh, we're not selling out, you know. And yep. It's like, you know, ten thousand is good. Well, anyway, whatever it is, it becomes Flair and Terry Funk's fault, and more Flair because Terry oh, Funk. Wow. Terry Funk was always going to be only a short-term thing anyway. So I just remember, you know, hearing the whole thing of we got to get rid of Flair. As soon as we get rid of Flair and get to Sting, you know, everything's going to turn around because Sting's Sting's young and he's good-looking and Rick's old. And, you know, that's that's the mentality. We've got to go to Sting. A new face I, in the uh, the Starcade history here at Starcade 89 is KG Muto as the great Muto. He comes in with a new face paint gimmick, Gary Hart as his manager. Quickly on Keiji Muto, what was his stature in Japan at the time, 1989? And did this run with the great Muto gimmick in the United States, he wrestles both Ric Flair and Sting at the 89 Starcade, boost his stature at all? Okay, so Keiji Muto had worked uh, Dallas as Super Black Ninja and Puerto Rico and um, Florida a little bit. You know, he was on... You know, he was a, a, a good – I remember when he started in, in New Japan, and he had those cool moves. Yeah. And I thought he was – you know, he, and he was, you know he's like 6'2", six, 6'3". Six, I mean, he's not a small guy. I mean, for a Japanese guy, he was really big and, and you know, probably 235, 240, good body. Um, I, you know, I, I thought he was going to be the superstar of New Japan, and, and he was later. But, I mean, I, I just remember that. So he comes to this country, and he, he does real, you know – He's wrestling real well. He doesn't get a push anywhere substantial. Then he comes to WCW, and the first night, I, don't, I think the first night was one of the clashes, and I think he wrestled maybe Stephen Casey. I, don't, I, I could be wrong with the guy, but he, he had two matches. He had a clash match, and he had another TV match, which tore the house down. Everybody cheered him, um, and, uh, you know, then they, they booked him with Sting, and him and Sting had, had you know, it was like Flair and Terry Funk and Muda and Sting. Mm-hmm. And those were the two big matches, and they were great matches every night. Um, you know, you know, Muto was was a great wrestler. So um, after the Sting thing kind of runs its course, there's you know everybody wants you know everybody wants Muto to be a babyface. And I know Gary Hart ripped on me in his book over this one, but you know, I'm sorry. I mean, I I know what was happening at those booking meetings from multiple people, and Gary is the one. He's fighting the turn. Everybody, you know, they're at all these ideas and Gary's fighting the turn. And mm-hmm. then finally, you know, I think they were going to do the turn um, that, that uh, you know, he would lose the three matches 
And I think that in 90, they were going to do the baby face turn with Mudo finally. Maybe they weren't. It was not set in stone that they were, but I mean, the sentiment was getting stronger to do it. But he was he didn't understand losing three times at Starcade. So he quit and went home mm-hmm. and, and he went to Japan and, you know, they started pushing him there and he became, you know, not right away. But it, it helped because he was a legitimate star in the U.S. and, you know, national star in the U.S. And very few of the Japanese, you know, the Japanese wrestlers come to this country in most cases, like with Okada or Nagata. I mean, they're super talented guys and usually they're used as jobbers. Chono, Chono had some success in Kansas City, but it was only Kansas City, you know, a small time territory. Hashimoto had no real success. Worked Memphis, Calgary, you know, no big deal. Um, Liger, you know, did okay in Calgary, but not not big. Hase did very well in Calgary, um, but it's still Calgary. It's not national. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, you know, Inoki was never even a big national success. The only one of all the guys, the Japanese, you know, I mean, the, the, you know, Masa Saito was a was a success everywhere he went, but. You know, he's he had a career in the United States. He never, you know, Japan was not his home. The mm-hmm. United States was his home. He would go back to do some tours of Japan as, as you know, an outside Japanese foreigner. You know, he was never a full timer there, hardly ever. I mean, he had a period where he was, but usually he wasn't. Whereas, you know, Mudo, the thing, you know, the the ba- Baba was a huge success in the United States, and until Baba, the only one, Sakaguchi, not really that big of a success. Kojika, a little bit, but what about Jumbo? Uh, Jumbo was was protected because he was Baba's guy and he was right, so great. Right. But it wasn't like Jumbo was did well in Amarillo, and I mean I saw Jumbo Saruta in Florida, um, you know when his you know first or second you know year, and he would do like this. I remember seeing him do a twenty minute match with Danny Hodge on the second match of the card, and it was just like holy. Wow. wow. But it sounds you know, like of all these guys you're naming, these Japanese legends, Mudo is the one that's hitting me as not already established as a superstar in Japan when he comes to America. He he becomes a superstar in America and right, returns right, to right. Japan bigger. Right. Like Fujinami and Tenru were two others. Like they worked mid-Atlantic, but they were they right. were prelim guys. Uh, Jumbo Jumbo was never used as a prelim guy because Baba always took care of him. But Jumbo was not a star in the United States. He would he would come to St. Louis and, the, and he would he would be in a big match and he would be pushed as a star, but he wasn't really a star. Right. Um, you know, he came to like I said, he can't. I saw him in Florida and him and Danny Hodge did this tremendous twenty minute draw, but it was the second match on the card. But I mean, when we watched it, it was like. Ooh, God damn. Yeah. You know, because Jumbo Saru had one of the best drop kicks when he was young and he was, he was fantastic. But, um, there you go. Mudo, um, here we see an 89 star gate, a, a big boost to, uh, to the Japanese scene being provided by uh, WCW of all people. Yeah. So, but, but Mudo was the first one. Yeah. Mudo, when he left was a prelim guy. Then he, he became a big star in WCW first. And then when he went back to Japan, he was an American success, which is the thing that eluded most of your Japanese guys. I mean, how many of them, I mean, how many of them were really American successes? I right. mean, I, you know, just Mudo and, Mudo and Baba pretty much. And Liger, Liger, I think, to a degree, but never, never to the level of Mudo. So the Andersons are back, too, on this show. They corner Flair. They had made their return. Um, Arn coming back after the Brain Busters run in, with Vince McMahon. They return in 89. Um, make a save. Save him from Gary Hart, so, and that starts that. So, no, no, no. So, so, here's the, so here's the interesting thing there. Yeah. I think Ole may have gotten that run because of uh, Jim Hurd and Tully's problem. Oh, okay, but because 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 Ric Flair was the booker. Yeah. This is after after George Scott. So George Scott George Scott gets fired as booker um, the week before WrestleMania of 1989 because okay. they have the Flair Steamboat. They do the second clash head to head because they're still fighting. And um, well, this was the one where. The cable companies, what was the deal we talked about? Vince was trying to get, Vince and the cable companies were having a showdown. Mm-hmm. And the cable companies went to Ted and go, you know, screw Vince. You know, he's trying to get a higher percentage or something. So we're going to just go on your, you know, the same day as Vince, we're going to put you, we're gonna, you, you give us a, pay, a pay-per-view card. Mm. And Vince was going to be, Vince was going to get the, 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 the Starcade treatment. Um, so... The idea was that um, Vince would lose; he would have WrestleMania, and it wouldn't be on pay per view. Wow! He, you know, he would, you know, he would still be able to do close circuit, and he, you know, um, by that point, let me think, eighty nine. Well, that would close be WrestleMania circuit. five, Hogan and Savage. That was like the last one, and it was a uh, last gasp. I think you could see uh, Hogan and Warrior on some screens, but that was really the last close circuit one. 
Right, but the closed circuit was was the last big closed circuit was was four. Three. Four four was already down a lot. Yeah, yeah. Three was one two one was huge. Two was good. Three was the the biggest of them all as far as closed circuit. Yeah. And then four was down because pay, as pay per view grew, yeah. closed circuit you know game started becoming obsolete. So four so so anyway, um, so yeah, this, so he would still, he'd still have the closed circuit, but he would have no pay per view. And then um, Vince and Vince backed down, which is very rare, but he did because he saw what was going to, you know, the last thing he needed was, mm-hmm. was to, to, to not have pay-per-view at WrestleMania and then to have WrestleMania lose its luster because he got, you know, let's face it, he got his ass kicked the year before on the free TV thing. So, so, um, so this leads to Ole coming back somehow. Well, what, so, 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 no, so Flair, so, so Scott as Booker, so, so anyway, the, it, what, what ends up happening is, is that they back down, but since they promised, um, um, there was there, there was basically the cable companies had, had, after the this, the clash the year before had, had cost them so much pay per view revenue from WrestleMania. The cable companies went to both sides and just go because you know Vince did it first and then Crockett did it. Right. Crockett, Let's knock this off. Let's stop cannibalizing yeah, each other. No right. More, no, no, no. There's no more free TV than this. Rings a bell. Yep. Yeah, because because you know the cable companies made half the pay per view money. Right. So, so it's like, there's no more, you know, Ted Turner and, and whoever was running USA, you know, you are not allowed to do any televised wrestling when there's a pay-per-view from the other side. So that era is done. Well, they come down and, um, Vince, Vince backs down essentially mm-hmm. from the thing, <clears throat> but, but they've already at, they've already advertised their show. They're already ready to do this pay-per-view with the Flair Steamboat 60 minute match. Yeah. And. So, so what ends up happening is because the companies felt so bad, it's like, okay, never again after this, but you already got the thing. You can do a free TV. You can do a free TV head to head with them. And, you know, and then, and then you, get a, you some, get a waiver on the rules, so to speak. Get a, and, and also they wanted to, you know, again, I think they wanted to sort of teach Vince a lesson too. They weren't mm. really happy with Vince pulling the power play because they weren't happy Vince pulled the power play at that Thanksgiving show. Yeah. They all backed down to him, but they weren't, you know, they thought they were going to double the revenue to, you know. Hey, you're gonna get two paper, two two fifteen dollar pay per views instead of one, and and people are already buying. People are gonna buy one. They're gonna probably buy both, and they yep. probably would. So they thought this was gonna be this great pay per view day, and then Vince, you know, ruined it. So so you know, Vince and the cable companies had their issues anyway. So you know, it was it was that. So anyway, before that, Scott is um, Scott is is behind the times. So Scott doesn't advertise the uh, the Flair Steamboat match. Or that card, they barely push it on television because Scott thinks, well, if I'm advertising this match for free TV, no one's going to buy tickets to the house shows, which is logical because they were doing Flair and Steamboat at every house show. So, um, but but you know that's not what the Turner people that that you know are are, are booking the show head to head with WrestleMania that 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 their own wrestling show isn't promoting the freaking big special, and it, it you know it did it, it didn't do a big rating. So the week before. After the last TV where they didn't push it hardly at all, they fired George Scott right. for not promoting it. So Ric Flair becomes the booker, the head of a booking committee. So Ric Flair, the thing he does is uh, – first thing he wants to do is bring back Tully and Arn, of course, right? Mm-hmm. They're his buddies and and they weren't – you know, they were doing they were doing okay in WWF, but they weren't as big as stars there. Vince had them in that tag team slot and Vince – they were they were champions, but but they were not like the top guys. They would, you know, and they weren't used as singles at all. And so they wanted to come back anyway. So Rick negotiates a deal for um, for 250000 each, which was a lot more than they were making with Vince. But they would both come in, and they were thrilled. And that's, that's a great deal. Yeah. So they agree to come in. They give their notice. And Tully, I guess in celebration, um, celebrates too much. And suddenly, I mean, mm. you know, before signing the contract, fails the drug test for cocaine. Jim Hurd hears this and it's just like, I can't hire this guy who just failed a drug test for cocaine. So he just goes, uh, you know, I'll, you know, Tully's out, and I don't think Arn's that valuable without Tully. So Arn, Arn, who's already given notice, is cut from 250 to 156. So Arn comes in for 156, which I think is probably less than he was making for Vince. So you know, so now Flair's unhappy. Um, so this is the, I think where the problems with Jim Hurd start is Flair feels that, you know, he, he, 
his friends both got screwed because I think that Flair and everyone in the world believes, you know, would Tully have been suspended for that drug test violation if he hadn't given notice, you know, two days before? Mm-hmm. It may, you know, he may very well have, but no one knows. And the, the belief is he wouldn't have because everyone wants to believe that everything's corrupt in wrestling. I, I can't say that Vince wouldn't have because Vince, Vince did suspend other people. And, you know, and there were people who failed drug tests that Vince didn't suspend too. So it's and, – and Tully wasn't that that big of a priority to Vince. So I think Vince may have suspended him either way. But but neither here nor there. So so that situation – so now Arn's in without a partner. I think that's where Ole comes back. Ole comes back. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Very good. So finally on Starcade 89, we get uh, Sting – in the main event, he defeats Ric Flair. Uh, there had been a storyline where he joined the Horseman, um, is still in the Horseman at the time of Starcade 89, but as a result of pinning Flair and kind of breaking out, the Horseman eventually turn on him, they shoot a big angle, he gets booted uh, from the Horseman. When do you remember it becoming clear, Dave? And we kind of touched on it, I guess, earlier when you talked about Eddie Gilbert telling you how big a babyface Sting was going to be, but when do you remember it becoming clear? that Sting would be the guy to take the WCW mantle? Oh, so take the mantle? Probably um, right, right around then, because because it was like Flair was the institution, but by that point, it was right around Starcade. I think a little before Starcade when I started hearing all the, you know, like Flair's booking and, um, you know, business isn't that good, and Flair's getting all the heat as booker and world champion. And, and, and I knew it was bogus, but I mean, it was, that's, you know, that's what I'm hearing people. It's like, as soon as we get that title on Sting, as soon as we get that title on Sting. So I knew that they were going with, so it's late 89. I mean, as far as when I knew Sting would be the big star, everyone knew the same. I mean, I, I knew he would be a star when, when Eddie Gilbert told me and I saw him in Houston, he got the pop and all that. But as far as like the real big star, you know, it was the flare match from Greensboro at the first clash. You watch that match and it's like Sting in one night became that was, you know, the, probably the second hottest baby face in the country behind Hogan. Um, I mean, it was just, it was, he, he, he had it. He had the charisma. Flair, you know, he was a, he was a good athlete. He wasn't a great worker, but, you know, with Flair, he was a great worker, you know, because Flair, that, that was Flair's gift. So, um, so at this point, we know that they're going, there's, um, there's a lot of back and forth in the sense of there were people who were just like, you know, if Sting gets the title, his inability to cut promos is going to start to show because Flair was such a great promo. And his inability to work great matches against people other than Flair is going to start to show. And people are used to a certain caliber of world title matches. And while Sting can do that with Flair and Flair, Flair, you know, Flair could do it with anyone, Sting can't do it with anyone. And there were some bad people that they had on top that, that Sting was, you know, so... There, there was, there were people who thought that Sting was going to be a bad idea because, because once he became champion, the microscope would be on him and, and his flaws would come out. And there were people who thought that Rick was just too old and, and it had to be Sting. So, but whatever it was, the decision was made to go to Sting as quick as possible, which was going to be that February pay-per-view from Greensboro. In fact, it was going to be um, on Flair's birthday. So it'd be uh, Flair's 41st birthday, right? Uh, 1990, February 25th. Um, that was going to be the night Sting won the title. And then Sting blows out his knee in the angle where the horsemen turn on him. So Sting's out. And then Luger, they, they decide to turn Luger back. So um, that's that's what happened there. So the flare thing not dropping into Luger comes – it wasn't in this one. Flair was never supposed to lose in Greensboro to Luger. They, mm-hmm. booked, a screw, they booked a screw job finish because they wanted to keep the thing going because they had no other choice. They – you know, everything was about Sting. They had built for Sting to win the title. They didn't want to give the title to Luger. The booking committee didn't want to give the title to Luger because they felt that Sting was the better babyface than Luger. And, um, you know, so that was just the uh, – and, and Luger just turned they, – they turned Luger babyface as a panic move. So if they give it to Luger, you know what, you give it to Luger for a month or two, then Flair wins it back, and then Flair immediately drops to Sting. They thought that was a bad idea. I would have thought so too. So that's what happens there. So they do something, whatever the screw job is that they do with the Luger, in the Luger match. So at what's ha- so business is getting worse. Um, and now they're thinking like, well, business is bad because we don't have Sting. So as soon as Sting comes back, everything's going to be great. But they're just so down on Rick. So now they're at this point where 
there's all these people are good. The reason everything's bad is because of Rick. You know, we're not getting, you know, we're not getting the kids demo because Rick's too old. Um, we've got to take the title off Rick. The only person to take, you know, Sting's injured. The only person to go is Luger. But it makes no sense because their idea of the top guy was Sting. So putting on Luger is just stupid. But they come to this idea, we got to put it on Luger. So they're going to put it on Luger at a house show in, I believe, St. Louis. And that's where Flair was just like, I'm not doing it. We promised to Sting. Flair's already been kicked off the booking committee. But, or Flair, I shouldn't say kicked off. Flair quit the booking committee two weeks before the um, – the Greensboro match. So it's early February. Flair and Hurd had a big fight because um, the Flair got the ratings up to, um, they did, uh, I believe it was uh, a 4.0 and a 4.4 on a Saturday and a Sunday, which, you know, considering they were doing the twos for a long time, Flair was like thinking he's getting this big pat on the back. I remember they did a, a Flair Brian Pillman match on a Saturday TBS show, which Flair won. And, and Flair had to be – Kevin Sullivan had to, had to convince Flair. Flair wanted to put Pillman over, which made no sense because the pay-per-view was Flair and Luger. And Kevin Sullivan's going like, it makes no sense. The pay-per-view is you and Luger. Why are you putting Pillman over? Look, Pillman's got all this – Pillman – we can make Pillman a star, you know? And um, so they do the match. Flair beats Pillman, you know, kicking and screaming, wanting to lose to the guy. Then the next night, I think it's um, – I think it's Flair and Arn against the Rock and Roll Express. And I think that they do a 4.4. So the ratings come in, and now Flair's feeling really good because, you know, and, now, and hey, the, the, you know, all those TBS people, ratings is their thing. And then Jim Hurd goes, ah, it should have been a five. Uh, you know, we need to get the ratings bigger. And, and Flair was just, you know, he, you know what I mean? That's when it, it really hit. And, you know, and Hurd's trying to get him to cut his hair, which, you know, Flair's hair was his gimmick. And so, you know, it was just, it was just bad. So, so he quits his booker. And um, then since he's out as booker, you know, Hurd is now trying to get this thing where we got to get the title on it on the, on the Luger as quick as possible because, you know, we got we got to do that. So Flair is refusing a job to Luger, saying I promised it to Sting and it makes no sense this, and, and all this. And that's when it really came to a head, you know, and, and um, you know, it, it, you know, eventually, like a year later, it came to a real big head. And then, you know, Flair quit, but or was fired, whatever it was actually I guess he was technically fired, whatever it was. But but at this point, um that's that's the whole thing that was going on at that point, yeah.